Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hello, and welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of Syosset Public Library. I'm Jen, uh, your co-host for today, and I'm here with an extremely interesting and prolific writer. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Hi, Jen. Yes, my my name is Mark Pryor, and uh, the book is Die Around Sundown. Awesome. Yeah, I loved this book. I thought it was so much fun. It was so gripping. And um, before we get into the specifics of the book, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about your uh, career trajectory, because in addition to being a writer, you've had a lot of very interesting careers. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a long road, um, but an interesting one. I actually initially started out as a journalist in England, um, when I did that job for a few years, I covered the police beat. Uh, when I moved to America 250,000 years ago, uh, I went to journalism school in North Carolina, and then I went on to law school, um, did some civil uh, litigation for a while and hated that. Um, just lots of rich people suing each other. I couldn't stand it. Uh, so I went back and kind of renewed my interest in, in all things criminal and um got a job with the district attorney's office as a felony prosecutor here in Austin, Texas. Uh, Did that for 15 something years, uh, up until about three months ago, when a couple of uh, former prosecutor buddies of mine who had a uh, a successful criminal defense practice asked me to come and be a partner with their law firm. And um, here I am, that's what I'm doing. Very cool. Um, Do you feel like these uh, different careers shaped your writing or your approach to writing? Yeah, I mean, they certainly made it um, a lot easier, I think, in in quite a few different ways. Um, I've, you know, obviously have a lot of friends who are uh, mystery writers. Uh, It's a very, very close, very welcoming community. Um, But I, talking to them, I realized that I'm I'm lucky in that I, I tend to write very, very quickly. Um, and my first draft of a novel, everyone else always says, you know, allow yourself to write terrible first draft and then sort of correct it. Uh, my first drafts tend to be very close to the, to the final thing. Mm. Uh, and I think it's a combination of having been a journalist, uh, I can, I can slam a story together quickly if I need to. Um, and being a lawyer, I don't like imprecision, so I can't write something that doesn't make sense or that just, you know, when you look back at it, it's kind of gibberish. I, I just, I don't like to do that. So um you know I one of my novels I wrote in about 10 days wow (laughs) may have had something to do with with my mother-in-law being staying with us at the time but um (laughs) no it just means I can when I when I need to write quickly and and accurately I can do it Mm, that's really interesting I never thought about how uh journalism and it's really tight time constraints might make it um easier perhaps to produce to deadline or to you know produce a really precise draft on your first go that's really interesting yeah and the other thing about that is that um when when you talk to most authors you'll say well how long was your first draft oh it was 125,000 words I had to cut it down my my final draft will usually end up between three and eight thousand words longer Mm -hmm. I actually add to it and again I think it's that journalistic influence of you know just the facts and then I you know I'll, I'll read it I'll be like well this needs a little bit of color a little bit of um, you know, description or something. So yeah, my, my final drafts are always longer than my initial ones. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, that like you kind of addressed the next question I had, which is how you balance your incredibly prolific writing career with these other jobs, because none of them are really like, you know, nine to fives that you do while you're at the office and then just go home and don't think about. They're like very time consuming jobs too. And so how do you balance uh these careers? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know because I always feel like I'm an inherently lazy person. Um, but I guess maybe, maybe not. I think, I think the way I I usually put it is that I never have a moment in time that is not spoken for. Um, you know, I, every, I'm never sitting around at home or wherever thinking, Oh, what should I do now? Mm. Um, it's, it's, a you know, my son's soccer game or, one of my kids needs this or it's a 
a work thing or it's you know time I blocked out to go to a coffee shop or a library and write um so you know when I if I ever get to retirement it's going to be an interesting time um thumb twiddling is not something I've I've not a skill I've developed <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a, that is a skill in and of itself to sort of learn how to have unstructured time for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm really interested uh, in this book because it is the first in a, a new series. Uh, and you have written series before, but you've also written um, standalone books like Hollow Man. And I was wondering if you have a different process for when you are approaching a standalone story, um, as opposed to when you are telling an ongoing story that's going to be told through multiple books. Huh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the process, I definitely have a different process in mind when I'm writing a series, mm -hmm. because I know I, I'm in each book, I'm sort of setting up a, a an overarching series of themes or um, characters, you know, that I want to know. I know what I want them to do in the next book, perhaps. Um, whereas, in you know, writing Hollow Man, for instance, um, that turned out to be two two books. But I, it, oh. <laughs> you're right. Initially, I, I, I was supposed to be a standalone, but I had so much fun writing it uh, <laughs> that I did a sequel. Um, but for that, it was just, it was more of a one-off. It felt like more of a one-off experiment. Like, can I do this? Uh, can I write just a one-off standalone novel? And it turns out, no, I can't because I wrote a sequel. <laughs> um, but you don't have, you don't have to think ahead about, well, I can't kill this character because then they need it in the next book. But you, but so I, I can, you can in a standalone. Mm. Um, so it's a bit of a different process. Um, but I, I like the world building of a series. Um, I'm really excited about this new one just because it's it's uh, stepping into a new world. It's Paris in 1940. I mean, I've never been there before. And most people who read the book will never have been there before. Um, and so I'm really excited about building a, a lasting world for, for the characters and for the readers. That's amazing. That segues perfectly into my next question, because one of my favorite things about this book was just how uh, vividly realized Paris was during World War II. And it's a, it's a really evocative and very, um, very powerful image of a city under Nazi occupation, um, while it's also being occupied by all these different luminaries, like artists and people who became really important to history. And I was wondering, uh, what draws you to Paris as a setting? Because this isn't the first time that you've set something in Paris, right? <laughs> no, it's the ninth, I think. <laughs> um, thank you for, for those kind words, first of all. Um, Paris, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, it's incredibly obvious why Paris, because, you know, I, I always tell people I have author friends who set their books in East Texas or rural New York, and, and who has more fun doing research, me or them? <laughs> <laughs> That's the, so that's one sort of elementary reason. Um, but Paris, as a city, I've, I've been there, I don't know, a couple of dozen times. Um, it still holds a place in my heart, always will. It's a beautiful place. Um, and, and for me, setting a book there in the war, it, one of the beauties of Paris is, ironically, the thing they make fun of the French for, which is giving up in the war, right? They're always like, ah, you know, you, you gave up so quickly. Um, but having in doing so, right, they, they preserve the city. Look at what happened to London and Berlin and Dresden and, you know, pretty much every other major city in Europe. Mm. Um, it got bombed to shreds. But you can walk down the streets of Paris, the same streets that um, Henri, my character, walked down, and, and they're basically unchanged. Uh, the beauty of Paris that was there in 1800 is still there. Um, and so I, I think it's it's interesting to explore why that happened, but also appreciate that it did happen. Mm, that is so fascinating. You know, it's really, that's a very interesting point that you make about um, the way that Paris is preserved as a city in a lot of ways that other European cities aren't because of the war. Um, and, you know, it does also highlight that, like we do, there is the stereotype of um 
of France as surrendering too quickly, but there was like a really strong resistance movement too, you know, and so they were doing their own types of working against the occupation too. Um, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, that like that brings me to Henri because he's a really cool and interesting protagonist. Can you tell me a little bit about where he came from and sort of how you shaped him to be your um, your point of view character for this historic Paris? Yeah, um, you know, I, I used to get asked a lot about my other main character, who, uh, whose name is Hugo, um, and I had a good answer for that because he was, you know, partly my dad. And he was partly some some FBI uh, profilers that I'd met and worked with, uh, stuck them together and came up with Hugo. I don't really have that good of an answer for Henri, um, except that uh, I like a a character. I, I do have to give a nod actually to a, a character called Bernie Gunther, who is the main character of um, brilliant books by Philip Kerr. Um, he he's definitely an inspiration. Bernie Gunther is an inspiration for Henri. Henri's not quite as, um, I don't know if amoral is the right word, but he, he, that's not the right word. He, he, Bernie's a little grittier, um, but then Philip Kerr is a little grittier than me, so it makes sense. Uh, but I wanted, I wanted Henri to be a smart, smart aleck, uh, to push back and to, to have a, a deep and troubled history. And he's, you know, we can't really talk about what that is because that gives away a lot of what's in the book. Mm -hmm. But he he's not who you think he is. Uh, and, and he knows it. And, and essentially one other person knows it. Um, and it shapes who he is. It shapes how he does, carries out his life. Um, and I think he's a more, in, in, in that way, he's a more genuine character for me than other ones that I've created in that the, the only you see on the page is a result of his backstory, not a result, not a result of me mushing my dad with a couple of FBI profilers and coming up with the character. Henri really does come out of, and, and you know, you if you read the book, you fully learn, you will understand what I'm talking about. Mm. Um, he really does grow out of his own self, his own history. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that um, you know, that backstory <clears throat> that will remain vague about um you know, creates really interesting stakes for the story, you know, because there's a really interesting tension, I think, uh, inside this character who has so many secrets that he's reckoning with and hiding and sort of, you know, yeah, just like not really wanting to communicate to other people, but while also being in the process of, you know, uncovering other people's secrets or trying to bring information to light and to make stories out of, you know, disparate clues and all these things. So there's a real interesting tension between like what his job is and his past, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, his, you're right. His job is to uncover uncover other people's secrets, right? The, the worst secret that somebody has is that they killed somebody and it's his job to discover that. And then meanwhile, he comes to find out that he has his own incredible secret um, and then somebody else is trying to do the same to him, um, which of course he's horrified and thinks is terribly unjustified. Um, but you, you know, you mentioned the, the, um, the characters, uh, Picasso is a character, sort of a mild character, uh, but, but writing historical fiction for the first time. Um, and, and I bring this up because one of the ways the story is told, right, is through his, his friend, um, Mimi. Uh, he, he has a lot of talks with her um, but one thing I discovered was it's really hard to write historical fiction and have strong female characters um, and that's because the detective the chief of police like it, 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 everybody is a man back then except unless you were a secretary or a teacher or something it's so it's incredibly it was it was a it was really interesting um, and I stumbled across a mention of uh, Lady, no, sorry, Princess Marie Bonaparte. Mm. Yeah, just whatever research I was doing, uh, found her interesting. And, you know, she's a real person. She's the great grandniece of the, the little em emperor himself. Um, and she had a, developed an interest in, in psychology, psychoanalysis, they called it then. And she worked with Sigmund Freud. Um, I guess she was a patient and then she became a friend and then she became kind of a colleague and she actually helped him escape Paris. But when I when I read her story and that she was in Paris, I was like, oh, my goodness, I have to grab onto this incredible woman um, and make her a significant character. Um, 
you know, I think that's, that's a huge slice of luck that I managed to, because I did not want a book full of white guys, <laughs> even though that's, even though that's who ruled the world back then. I, I was trying to step away from that a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, it's a really interesting um, <clears throat> project, you know, when you are writing about uh, historical women, because you're right that their roles were so constrained by their societies. Um, so the project is almost to like find these little pockets of agency, you know, like the spaces where they could act and could make decisions and affect their own lives and the lives of others. So how did you navigate that with Mimi? I think that's like, she's such a great character too. And <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 you know, I almost take no credit for it because the, the, the character that you see on the page if, in my book is kind of how I envisioned her, mm -hmm. how, how she was. I mean, there's a, there's a whole book about, there's a biography of, about her. Um, and if you if you read that, then you'll see how strong she was, how smart she was. Now, uh, you know, the, talking about pockets of agency, I think she had that agency through a privilege of her own, mm -hmm. right? Which was wealth. Yes. Um, and and but that you know, there's no harm in shining a light on that too. Is mm -hmm. that you know, had she not had that wealth and those connections, um, almost certainly she, she wouldn't appear in the book because she wouldn't have been anybody. Um, which is of course itself something to, to think about, to talk about. Um, but yeah, she's, she's, I realized very quickly, I, I, she's a character, for example, that, that if I was writing a standalone, um, I wouldn't be so careful to preserve her. Mm -hmm. I'm very careful to preserve her to be an ongoing character in future books. And, and she plays uh, a major role in, in the second book too. And, and we'll continue to do so because I she's, She's, she's fun to write. I mean, she's kind of like, she's a bit like Henri, right? They have this big tension between them. She's a smart mouth, just the same way he is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, their their personalities have uh, a certain, in certain areas overlap that make them really fun to watch bounce off each other, but also is like a source of very engaging and fun friction that I just, I really enjoyed that yeah. dynamic. <laughs> yeah, and she's truly, she's really interested in him and, and you know, ha having led that privileged life, this is this is a chance for her to to get to know somebody on a really deep level um you know and, and as you know she's she's the one who kind of wheedles the secret out of him mm -hmm. um and and seeing him trust a woman with that uh is a huge breakthrough for him too mm -hmm. yeah it's very interesting the way that the story kind of balances <clears throat> um Henri's inner journey as it were with like the outer effects uh, events that are are surrounding him so and he's he's really struggling with um you, you know doing both these things at the same time but they do feed into each other in, in interesting ways like the the two ongoing storylines really do sort of feed into each other in a really interesting way i hope that makes sense <laughs> yeah i mean i think you know just as a as a matter of craft you can't write a book that has two parallel tales that don't connect. Mm. Um, and in fact, when I first wrote, it's interesting you, you sort of raise it that way, when I first wrote the book, um, I wrote it in, in two very distinct timelines, um, bouncing back and forth. Mm. And my agent sort of said, well, it's, you know, love everything about it. You know, she always says, love everything about it. But <clears throat> um, she wanted more connection mm. between the past and the present uh and so instead of now having just telling the story what happened in the past and then bouncing back to the future you know the way i constructed it is mimi is, is the is the medium for that right it's it's him going to talk to her in her apartment having a glass of expensive wine which is the bribe to get him to talk <laughs> uh, which now i think about it, it might be slightly unethical um <laughs> but back then who knows uh and and you know she yeah, so she sort of teases it out. She asks about his day, how things are going along. And of course, she's much less interested in the new murder than she is in his history. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to talk about without giving things away, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a particular struggle when I am interviewing mystery authors because, um, yeah, the plot is very important. And there are so many like twisty turns and revelations and things that you, you know, 
are excited about, like that you really want to talk about, but absolutely can't because you want the reader to exactly. approach it with the same level of um, ignorance as it were, <laughs> as exactly. you did going exactly into right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, one question I have is about your approach to historical fiction, because you are obviously setting the story in a real time period and using these real figures. And I'm wondering, um, what is your approach to research? Like, did you research the city under occupation? Did you research the figures that you use? And, you know, when you're writing, where does research end and imagination take over? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think it's a really interesting discussion to have with with readers because uh, there there are differing expectations from different people. So to, to answer the question, yes, I did. I read several books. I uh, went to a couple of museums over there in Paris, um, <clears throat> read a lot about it. Uh, and I think it's important too, because I think you can paint a picture. Uh, and I always say this about uh, describing a place. Um, it, it, you have to be careful or skillful or crafty or whatever it is about how you paint that picture. And, and the example I'll give is, you know, there's no, it doesn't do me any good really in the book to describe um, the Eiffel Tower or, you know, whatever it is, Arc de Triomphe. Everyone knows what that looks like. But when I write in the book about a lamppost that is wrapped in padding, because when they turn the lights off in Paris because of the war, people get cr crashing into, walking into, lampposts <laughs> so, so they're like well what are we gonna do we can't turn the lights on okay we'll just wrap padding around the lampposts that's a really to me that's like a really powerful image mm. of, at, the, at the lowest level of what's going on um and of course i didn't make that up that that came from a book that's a real thing that happened um but 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 the, the line because you can you can go too far right and, and every every writer who does anything historical will tell you that they'll spend four hours going down rabbit holes just to find one tiny little fact. Mm -hmm. And and the other side of that is readers calling you on, on stuff that you get wrong. <clears throat> well, I used to care about that a lot more than I do now. Uh, if someone if someone does a detailed dig into Picasso, where he was and when, you know, I, maybe he wasn't at his apartment on that day. Uh, but I think the suspension of disbelief that a reader applies to a book generally um, there's no harm in them extending that grace to individual errors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes a reader is wrong. I once had somebody, I, I, one of my books, I had a uh, character eating strawberries in the Pyrenees Mountains in winter. And she wrote to me and said, you can't get strawberries in the winter in, Pyren in the Pyrenees. And I phoned my mother who was living there at the time and said, hey, mom, can you get strawberries in the winter there? And she kind of hesitated and said, well, yes, dear, but I think it'd be cheaper if you just buy them there. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't know. She goes, yeah, of course. It's not the 1800s. Did you go down? To, they might cost a little bit more, but you can get them. Um, and so I think some sometimes readers get really hung up on stuff. And my my take of it now is is more that if you can believe in all of these fake people, and you you can live with this fake murder of this fake person. The fact that I got a street name wrong, I think you should live with that too. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean, it's, it's, if I do something egregious, I think the big thing in, in, for murder and thriller writers is uh, weapons. If you get a weapon wrong, like if you put a silencer on a revolver, you'll hear about it for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, and so I try not to make too many egregious errors, but if I make one or two, I'm just not going to sweat it too much. Yeah. Yeah, there is a certain level of um, <clears throat> suspended disbelief that you need to commit to. And I think that, you know, like some facts are okay to take liberties with because they, <sighs> you are also telling a story in addition to, you know, depicting a historical period. And you have to balance the needs of, of fiction with the historical research aspect. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm allowed to create this world, mm -hmm. then I should be allowed to manipulate certain truths within it maybe I don't know yeah I agree um 
Let's talk a little bit about um, the stakes of the story and like the pacing. Um, I hope this question makes sense because I have <laughs> it's kind of a, a mess in my head. So let's see how it comes out. Um, the stakes are really high in this story. Um, it's there's a really tight time constraint. Um, he only has a certain number of days to um, discover the truth. There's a lot of high profile figures in this really tense historical setting. And so my question is, how do you like, how do you control the tension? Like, how do you keep it from boiling over too fast? How do you keep all the plates spinning? And how, you know, how do you um, pace the story so that things are, are revealed in, at the time in which they need to, in order to keep the reader hooked, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. A lot of it is, is um, it's, it's cooking, not baking. So with, with baking, for me, I'm just talking about me, for baking, you have, you measure out every single ingredient, right? You have to be so precise. Um, with cooking, it's, it's more like you take a sip, you take a little taste, oh, a bit more garlic, a um, bit more salt, salt, whatever it is. Um, for me, writing is like cooking, except I write better than I cook, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, know, I know what my recipe is generally. I know who's going to die. I know why, I know who did it. Uh, and I give myself, so you're right, I, I have that um, that timeline that he has to solve the crime by. And that's partly for me, so that I can make things happen quickly. Mm. Um, and interesting, or not interesting, I don't know, that that timeline changed. Like when he, when the, the German officer is like, you have days to fix it. That number changed throughout the book according to what I could realistically have on the <laughs> investigate. So like at the end, I'm like, oh wait, he, can, he couldn't do it in six days. He had to do it in eight days or whatever it was. So that, that number changes. And that's mm -hmm. what I mean about the cooking aspect. It's like, oh, you go back at the end and a bit more grated cheese on the top uh, to make it work. Um, and I'm very conscious when I'm writing to, to have uh, moments, impact moments, I think of them as, um, where, where the reader's going along and then suddenly something happens. They're like, whoa, that's what? I didn't a big reveal in this book for example before the well before you get to the end of the book there's like the big reveal mm -hmm. um, and normally the big reveal is the killer and i was actually worried that some people might be more interested in in the sub story about henri than the mystery itself um but we'll see that's to be determined <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're both super interesting and i think that um it's just uh uh, yeah, like the storytelling is just really good and the pacing is 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 really great in a way that I think keeps the reader involved. Um, like I read this book in like a day and a half because I just like couldn't <laughs> I couldn't put Thank it you. down. So <laughs> um so there's one last thing I wanted to ask, um, which is not about this book, but it's about a really interesting essay that I found uh on your website. Um it's called In Defense of Killing Off Main Characters. Yes. And I loved it. And, you know, as a, like, I, I have also written some stuff, like I've written comics, um, not novels, but um, I, you know, I remembered while reading your essay that like killing off main characters was really, really painful because you get attached to them over time, but it's also really fun, you know, because you know that like, it's, it's going to make your story interesting. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, how, how did you, like, why did you write that essay? And do you think, like, that the views that you talk about there affected the storytelling in this book? Um, I wrote that because in, in my other series, uh, in one of the books, I kill off a main character. Hmm. And, and I remember distinctly the moment I did it, sitting on the couch, writing the scene, and, and my wife walked in and she just looked at me and said, are you okay? And I wasn't. Like... I, I become attached to this character. I'm not saying who it is, just you know, in case. Um, but I wasn't okay because I hadn't really intended to to kill that person. But what I'd realized, and I, I do take this lesson into into this book, and it's my one critique of other some some books. You cannot have any character repeatedly shot, stabbed, thrown out a window. Uh, hit, hit by a bus, whatever it is, and then have them pop up and dust themselves off and be fine. There are times in books, as in the real world, where a character, a person, 
find themselves in a situation they just cannot get out of. And that's what happened to that character. I was writing the scene and in, the, in your mind, you're always thinking like, well, how do, how do they get out of this? And I was like, they don't. This person can't get out of it. It's just, it's just, it's not realistic. Even with the suspension of disbelief that we have going on, it's not realistic. And then I was thinking about it more. It's like, it makes sense, you know, it makes sense in, in the context of the story, but it makes sense to, to the real world too, where unexpected things happen. Like you do not expect reading a mystery novel and, and mine are not hard, you know, hard boiled noir mystery novels. You don't necessarily expect that. And I got some, some blowback. I had somebody come up to me in a bookstore when I was doing a signing, almost angry that this character was dead. And, and I explained to her, I said, you know, basically what I, I'm telling you. Um, and, and then they understood. And I think, I think doing that in a series is particularly important because there's a level of comfort that a reader has with these characters that doesn't allow for tension or real concern. So if I write 10 books and in every book, a main character is pursued, shot, chased, stabbed, whatever. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to book eight, nine, and 10, you know that that character is gonna be totally fine. But if, if you read a Mark Pryor book, you're not so sure about that anymore, right? Because I've killed a main character and by the way, in this series, the, the book that I'm currently working on, I'm considering doing that again. <laughs> um, and it will be a, a fairly, it will be a character that the reader will be familiar with and from book one, and they will, I will get some, some blowback probably. But I do think it's important to keep, it just keeps the reader on edge just a little bit, because when a character is in a bad situation, they're, they're not automatically going to get out of it because... Because that one time that one character didn't, it could happen again. Mm, that is so interesting. And, you know, this might seem like a tangent, but it kind of reminds me of the difference between like, you know, old 90s procedural television and like more modern forms of storytelling on TV. Because like, you're right that like when you've been watching like Law and Order for seven seasons, like you're not really going to like, it's harder to create stakes when you know that like everything has to reset at the end of the story so that it can start again. But having, allowing yourself to sort of like take risks with your characters and like disturb the status quo rather than, uh, you know, protect it, um, allows your story to have a lot more higher stakes and just be, I think, more interesting, you know? Yeah, that, that, that Law and Order is a great example. And compare that with Game of Thrones or something, you know, if somebody pulls a gun on Detective Stabler, you're pretty sure that he's going to be fine at the end of the episode, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, Game of Thrones, you don't know who's going to die next. Uh, it's crazy. So um, I think I think that is a part of modern storytelling. And I think it's I think it's a good part. I think I think it's it's hard to do. It is tough. To create a character and then be like never see you again um but you know yeah has to be done yeah gotta be done <laughs> um so without you know i know that authors aren't always at liberty to talk about this but do you have any idea of when we'll see Henri and mimi again yes actually uh precisely one year from well not precisely because it's going to be has to be on a tuesday i don't know if you know that but books always come out on tuesdays you probably did uh, it'll basically be a year from when Die Run Sundown comes out. The second the sequel will will come out um, next year. So it's already, it's already in the works. Edited. No, not completely edited, but yeah, we have we don't have a cover for it yet, but it's it's in the pipeline for sure. Oh great. That's awesome to hear. Um and I hope that, you know, maybe when that book comes out, you'll be open to coming back and, and talking to us again and talking about that one. Absolutely. I would love to. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. This has been a really good time. Um, okay, listeners, uh, Die Around Sundown is going to be available as of August 16th, I think just prior to the release of this episode. So by the time you're hearing this, you can pick it up at your favorite library or independent bookstore. Um, this has been Jen in conversation with Mark Pryor, and it is time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.